Hello, everybody. I am Matthew Miller. I am the Fedora project leader, and I'm here to talk about Nano, uh, which is a text editor. Now, um, this is a change, something that's new in Fedora 33 um, that I am not behind. I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with this, but I support it, and I'm excited to talk about it. Um, so first, I want to talk about um, what a text editor is and what this change is exactly. Obviously, we, I think we all know what a text editor is. It's a piece of software that you know edits text files. Unlike a word processor, it doesn't have fancy features for formatting and things like that. It, and it basically just ASCII Unicode text files, and that that's all it is. Often used as a programmer's editor, although there are more complicated IDEs that are um, specialized for programming. Um, a lot of text editors have programming features as well. Um, and uh, the important thing to note here is we didn't, you know, get rid of any text editors in Fedora. There's a, still a whole bunch of them, you know, VI Vim and Emacs and uh, Joe, which is the one I actually use the most myself. Um, a bunch of text editors are there, but we changed the default so that if you are in a terminal and something happens that makes an editor pop up, one of the most common things people come across is running git commit, and then it asks you for a commit message by popping up an editor. Um, but there are other cases um, when you want to like edit a file with sudo dash e, where the default editor is used. Um, and so historically, that default editor has been vim or vi. And um, the change here is just to make it so that the default is now nano. Uh, so uh, and this also doesn't affect like a graphical text editor, like gedit, something you might run, you know, in, in your um, GUI session. It's just when you get an editor at the terminal. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so why why what what's up with Nano? How did we get to Nano? Well, back in the beginning of time in Unix, um, the actual default text editor was a thing called Ed. Ed still exists in Fedora, and it is a line-based editor. So when you run Ed, it doesn't actually even show you the file you're editing. You have to print. You have to uh, run a command to print the file to show it. And when you edit, everything is basically kind of based on what line you're on. And then you edit. You um, you enter commands to change the text on that line. Uh, this seems crazy, but uh, if you consider that a lot of people weren't actually interacting with the computer via a, like a keyboard and monitor, but they actually had a teletype machine, which is basically a printer hooked up to a computer. It makes a lot more sense. Everything in Ed suddenly becomes becomes rational. Uh, it, it makes sense for the, this whole interface of I'm typing on a keyboard and the computer is going to print stuff back out. You may have seen this kind of thing in movies all the time. Movies like to show this as a computer interaction because it actually fits the narrative of a movie more than a computer screen does. Um, so hack hacker movies like to have teletype like displays. Um, and actually, this is an aside, but I think it's cool. I helped a blind and deaf woman get set up with Fedora a while ago, and she really liked this because she actually used a single line Braille terminal. It was basically a device that was you know, 20 characters of Braille that could, could show a line at a time um, and you know, mechanical Braille. And the Ed interface was perfect for that in a way that, you know, basically any like Windows or Mac editor uh, just wasn't, wasn't designed for. So that was cool. Anyways, uh, text editors, VI. Um, so this was this line-based editor. Um, then sometime, I don't know the decade, probably the 70s, uh, Bill Joy, who went on to to be a co-founder of Sun Microsystems, wrote this thing called VI. It stands for Visual Editor, and it actually has a whole full screen display of your file and shows the file you're working on. But um, the commands and the way it works are really still deeply tied to this idea of working line by line. And in fact, it has a mode-based editor. So there's an edit mode and a uh, display mode that are completely separate, and you switch back and forth. Um, it is a very powerful interface, and many people have come to love it, especially in the form of Vim, which is VI enhanced or VI improved, if that makes sense. Yes, um, which has a lot more features, including a lot of programming features um, that are like syntax highlighting and all sorts of fanciness. So people like VI. And I want to stress, VI is not going away. Vim is not going away. But one of its issues is when you start it, um, when it starts to edit a file, 
it is not obvious what to do. It is not obvious how to edit files. It's not edit. Um, it's not obvious how to enter text. It's not edit. N none of the commands are um, easily apparent to a modern computer user, and it doesn't really tell you what to do. In fact, it gives you a help message about what to do that doesn't really help unless you already know how to use the um, mode based interface. Uh, so Stack Exchange, the um, site for help with computer uh, questions and things. Uh, has a, a question about how to exit VI that has over 2 million views. Like it's one of their most popular questions. Help, I'm stuck in VI, how do I get out? And we actually saw that a lot in Fedora support things for new users. You get stuck in VI, what do you do? So that brings us to the change process. And I actually did a poll here and it seems like a lot of people um, here are not completely familiar with our change process, which is awesome because now I now I get to talk about it. Um, basically, uh, the change process is in, in Fedora. We have you know a lot of packagers working on different things, and in general, if you just want to make a change to your thing, you go ahead and do it. You maybe announce and develop list. I've done this, or you you just put it in the release notes. Those kind of things. But if you have a bigger change, it's going to affect a lot of people. We have a process called the change process, and there's a template for that, that you fill out. And once you've got that filled out, uh, you give it to our program manager, who's Ben Cotton at this time. Um, and Ben will work with you to get that all flushed out. And then that's submitted to develop us for discussion. So that's what happened here. Um, some people, Chris Murphy in specific, working in the Fedora Workstation Working Group, were looking at the problems that actual users are facing with you know, running, running Fedora and why, you know, what new users, what hurdles new users hit. And this came up as something that could be easily improved to make the experience better for new users. And so this was proposed. Uh, and I find this very funny because it's a very small change, really. Like nothing's being taken away. Nothing, nothing is, uh, no, nothing even, if, if you don't like, uh, if you don't like Nano, all you need to do is set your uh, editor variable in your, in, on your, like in your dot files to you know, whatever you like, I set mine to Joe, and then you'll get your editor of preference still. It's just changing what what comes up when you haven't configured anything, and when you, and when you just when you get a default editor of some sort. So this proposal uh, went to the develop list and had hundreds of very passionate messages, many more than a lot of our bigger changes like um, the compressed swap or ButterFS or even System D Resolve D. All of these things got got changed, uh, got, got discussed you know, to, to pretty pretty hot discussion on all of those, but by far people care most about changing the text editor. It certainly brings out people's passions. Um, but uh, after a long discussion, uh, FESCO, which is the Fedora Engineering Steering Committee, uh, decided to vote yes to this. And so um, it, is, it is now the default in Fedora 33. Um, and uh, here we are. So I think we've done a, a good thing and made uh, made it a little bit easier to use. When you run Nano, instead of bringing up into a complicated interface, it's a very simple thing with um, e easy controls like Control X, and the simple controls are listed at the bottom of the screen. When you go to exit, it prompts you if you want to save your file or not. Some basic kind of user-friendly features. Um, the Nano text editor actually comes. I know a lot about the history of text editors. I could I could write a very boring book. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you anyways. Um, there used to be um, a very popular. It still is a very popular um, text based email client called Pine, um, and Pine had an editor called Pico, which was basically designed for you know composing emails, and. Um, that was very popular, but um, under er, under a license that wasn't quite open source. So now. Units of small measurement, that's the joke. Um, and uh, to make a small basic text editor that's easy to use. And so that's where that comes from. Um, anybody have any questions about all of this? What text editor would I use to write my very boring book about text editors? I would probably use Joe. Joe is Joe's own editor, it's an acronym. Um, and it is a um, text editor that very roughly uses WordStar style key bindings. WordStar was a word processor that was popular in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, was also the key bindings that were used by the Borland 
uh, compiler, C compiler and Pascal compiler. Um, and I learned C programming using the Borland compiler and their IDE. So it was easy for me to pick up Joe when I switched to Unix and switched to Linux and didn't want to learn VI. I have a uh, long career as a sysadmin, so I did learn VI. I don't hate it. It's just not my go-to for writing. Great for editing config files, but um, for me, a text editor with modes is kind of a barrier to easy writing, so I prefer Joe for that. Um, ben Cotton says there's a thing called Word Grinder, which is very good for not being distracted and has a um, smart and handsome maintainer. Uh, and is Word Grinder a GUI text editor or a terminal based one? Uh, both. It can be both. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, and, we, and we do have a lot. One of the things um, that came up in discussion is why not G Edit, which is a um, you know, GNOME based um, text editor, uh, also pretty basic and simple, but is actually a GUI program rather than a console program. Um, the problem with that is running it out of a terminal. Like if you're doing a git commit, it kind of it popping up in a whole new window can be kind of a jarring experience. So we wanted something that would still be a terminal-based text editor. Um, there are some comments about Emacs being a whole operating system of its own there. This is true. When I worked at Boston University, a couple of my old school Unix admin coworkers and uh, programmers, software engineers there would literally start up Emacs like that, their computer would boot to Emacs, and then they would run everything from there. That was their operating shell. They're basically their windowing environment was an Emacs session. Um, very, uh, pe people who like it really like it. It's it's like the people who like tiling window managers. It's it's their own own special universe. Uh, people are throwing out text editors in, in the chat here. Any other questions? How do I exit Word Grinder, Ben? All right. Um, I, I think that's a good 15 minute overview of this change. I hope this was interesting to people. Um, I do not use Joe inside of Joe's window manager. I didn't even know there was such a thing, JWM, or is that just a, a coincidence with the J's? I'm not sure. Hey, Matthew. Yes, Marie. We've had the same question in here twice. Oh. I think it's a good one. Okay, um, for go. someone who's just starting out, what's easier to learn, Vim or Nano? Oh, so uh, the great thing about Nano is you barely have to learn it. It's just some basic commands, and you can tech, write and whatever. Um, there's not there's not a learning curve at all. Um, Vim is is something that has a, a hard learning curve. Like it takes a, it takes some deliberate getting used to to um, do it. Um, I think if you're interested in it, it is it can be very product a very productive environment if you want to spend the time learning to use it. Um, and you can use it as a programming editor and so on. I think these days, probably people use editors like VS Code, you know, Eclipse, some of the GUI editors a lot more for programming, um, although VI still is quite popular among programmers. Um, I think in some ways it, it kind of de depends on your use. One of the nice things as a sysadmin, um, VI is guaranteed to be there on pretty much any Unix or Unix-like Linux-like system. Um, you're going to have VI available to you. So knowing the basics is is a, is a good skill, especially if you want a sysadmin career. Um, if you're using it as a programmer, um, you could see if, see if it clicks for you. If it clicks for you, cool. If it doesn't, it's probably really not worth your time um, just for its own sake. Um, but if you like it, cool. Um, if you are not a programmer or a sysadmin, um, I think the only reason to really learn it would be to show off, which there's nothing wrong with that. But um, there, there are, uh, you know, th there's other other places you can invest your time that probably have uh, a bigger payoff for you. Cool. Um, some comments in the text. There's also a thing called NeoVim, which is better than Vim. Um, it's like Vim improved, improved, I guess. Um, oh, and someone says. Um, Nasir suggests that an adventure, vimadventures.com, a game to learn. Uh, so that sounds fun. Thanks, Matthew, for talking about Nano. Yep. Awesome. 